The production of this video was made possible by donors to the Orchestration Online Patreon Initiative. Please consider adding your support to the creation of free educational internet resources by visiting our Patreon page linked below. Hey there, this is your orchestration tutor, Thomas Goss, bringing you a lesson on the second half of Rachmaninoff's sweeping work, The Isle of the Dead, just in time for Halloween. Earlier this month, when I scripted the lesson for the first half of this piece, I was struck by how Rachmaninoff's imagination isn't spurred into directions that we normally associate with the subject of the afterlife or the supernatural. There's nothing macabre or creepy about this piece, with the exception of one intentionally spooky part toward the end. There aren't any frenzied hallucinations, as with Mussorgsky's Night on the Bear Mountain, or the fifth movement of Berlioz's Symphonie Fantastique. Nor is the piece tragic or self-pitying. It doesn't indulge in a sense of deep melancholy. Instead, what we hear is a work of enormous dignity and respect as if the departing spirit is musing on a life well-lived as it passes through a dark and lonely landscape. There's an element of sadness, to be sure, but it's tempered by acceptance and of honoring the human condition. As a tone poem, it illustrates a journey toward a final destination where the soul can be at peace, along with gently but irregularly surging waves. The episodes that evolve from this might be thought of as those different things that the human spirit must let go to be at peace, interpreted in music that stirs the imagination to envision towering cliffs, treacherous shoals, and occasionally a ray of light breaking through the gloom. But as far as we're concerned as orchestrators, it's a treasure trove of great scoring ideas that are unusually cinematic in character. I've already pointed out several passages from the first half that have been almost directly quoted by different film composers. As we go through the second half now, see if you recognize any further passages that might have served as inspiration for film cues. We left off in our first lesson at eight bars past rehearsal figure 14, where the music subsides to near inaudibility. Something that I thought I'd save mentioning until this lesson was the change of time signature even a little further back, from 5-8 to 3-4. Essentially, Rachmaninoff is just adding one eighth note to 5-8 time, and thus the change is almost imperceptible, except that the rhythm starts to feel more recognizably even. The new meter is, in fact, going to go on for quite some time, approaching the end of the piece, before changing to common time after figure 22, and then a variety of switching back and forth between 5-8 and 3-4, until finally settling on the original 5-8 patterns and scoring approaches of the opening. At the ninth bar of figure 14, we hear a deliciously solemn chorale in F minor by the brass section, with trumpets doubled by horns on the top three notes of the chords, and trombones and tuba below. The strings answer with vigorous tenuto downbows, which are given extra weight by the low horns. This is just a prelude to a very bittersweet, searching passage for violins and winds that's extremely simple in its scoring approach, but devastatingly effective nonetheless. Every note in every part is doubled in both sections. Actually, there's quite a bit of subtle machinations at play here, in the way that Rachmaninoff balances the strings, with first and second desks playing the melody and doubling with the first flute and English horn, while the rest of the violins play very delicate tremolo around both harmony and melody as the passage unfolds. Only a very slight touch from first horn adds some warmth and support at first. But see how much the winds can be subtracted once the horns really do settle into their role. From figure 15, Rachmaninoff relaxes the intensity and allows the wind timbre to come forward in simple interplay of thematic elements, but then starts to build on his previous approach towards an intensely integrated cantabile passage. With divisi cellos and violas entering the picture, 
The first and second violins can dominate the blending of timbres more correctly. Meanwhile, the winds can both double the strings and overflow with contrapuntal gestures, while more horns and finally even trumpets add to the mix. As you can hear, Rachmaninoff has pushed and pushed the emotional and intellectual tension of this passage to its limit. Now he's going to release it, allowing the music to soar like a hang glider pushed off a cliff into a warm updraft. And from here through to figure 18, the borrowing from film composers has been pretty heavy. It's not just the violin octaves above resonant winds and horns and glittering harp. It's also the committed Lydian mode of the melody, in E-flat major with the raised fourth step of A natural. For me, the most interesting scoring occurs from the Pew Vivo, where despite much doubling of strings on nearly every wind and horn line, the colors become more mixed than merged, with little gestures standing out here and there as contrast. These gestures start to gain more of their own independence, until the functions are once again operating with that complexity that Rachmaninoff is so fond of, and yet throughout all, the upper strings maintain control over the main thematic statement, taking it to ever more passionate heights. I love how the lower strings and winds team up as well with their own sweeping line, and the middle winds and brass emerge in yet a third idea until the tension is once again at an almost unbearable pitch. At the third bar after figure 18, Rachmaninoff shows some influences of his own, with a huge trombone statement that's almost a direct borrow from the first movement theme of Tchaikovsky's Fifth Symphony. 
It's transforming that theme in the direction of the dies irae, though, which will start to surface more and more from here on in the piece. You can hear just how hugely loud three trombones can be, and if that wasn't enough, Rachmaninoff adds the third trumpet and horns one and two. He wants the focus to be firmly on this entrance, so much that he doesn't bother to score any bass part for quite a few bars. The triple octave strings turn frenetic, with sixteenth note measured tremolo lines backed up by flurrying winds. I love how the brass statement fleshes out into a full-blown chorale by the end of the next page and then this whole massive architecture collapses under its own weight. Notice something here about this cool-down. While the winds, brass, and low strings are losing strength, the violins and violas maintain their level of force right up to figure 19. It's a superb psychological effect, keeping the suspense going all the way to the next page. At rehearsal figure 19, there's that rarest of featured lines, a rolled timpani solo. The answering statement from cellos and violas sounds extra dark because of doubling from the bass clarinet. What follows is more influence from Tchaikovsky in the pulsing low strings and low winds, but with a decidedly different lyrical quality on the thematic lines. Solo cellos, doubled by horns 2 and 3 and a 3 oboes plus English horn, have a dialogue with Sol G first violins, doubled by first horn alone. As you listen along, you'll see that the lower and heavier line stands out with far more projection, as it was intended to do, with a shimmering golden quality. Second violins doubled by second and third flute join in with yet another line, and soon the first violins leap up to octaves as more strength is added to their line by first flute. Once again, Rachmaninoff builds up the tension by adding more complexity and more weight to each function, until he achieves yet another towering tutti by figure 21. Though a huge page like this might seem completely unreadable and intimidating, you simply have to break down the functions to understand the texture. Flutes 2 and 3, players 1 and 2 for oboes, bassoons, and trumpets, and horns 5 and 6, all play the stuttering, syncopated chords. Upper strings play a triple octave melody, doubled by first flute and clarinets 1 and 2. Counter melody, of that theme we heard in tutti trombones, is blasted out by horns 3 and 4, and third players on both trumpet and trombone. Falling thirds on horns 1 and 2, doubled by English horn and bass clarinet. Interior pedal octaves by trombones 1 and 2. Bass line by contrabassoon, tuba, double basses, and arcing cellos. It takes far longer to break it down like that than to just see it, after training your eye to see the relationships and the doubling. This passage, all the way to the fourth bar after figure 22, is also heavily imitated in many epic film cues.
That ferocity before the Largo is a great example of how strings and brass can combine successfully, even in a fortissimo passage. What works here is that the strings are mostly playing in their lowest range, where the string weight is at its heaviest and the tone is potentially the most ferocious. Even the violas make a good combination with the low horns because they're playing an open fourth string C with a fingered third string C an octave above. This is about as heavy as violas can get. The brass are still the dominant timbre here, though. Let's hear just those few bars once more. At the common time Largo, 11 bars past figure 22, we finally get some appropriately Halloween-sounding music. Here we can see the influence of the Mighty Five on Rachmaninoff, particularly Mussorgsky, as this sounds like a lost page of sketches from Boris Gudinov, as orchestrated by Rimsky-Korsakov. Notice the cold, bleak tone of the Shalimo register clarinet notes. These chillingly simple tones are doubled by restless tremolo second violins. It's the emphatic reveal of that dies irae theme that was to haunt Rachmaninoff's music across his whole life, all the way up to his symphonic dances. Timpani, pizzicato strings, and harp come in to land heavily on the second and fourth beats. That's what reminds me the most of Boris Gudinov. The tightly squeezed sound of stopped first horn adds a sinister flavor to the ghostly proceedings. In this musical atmosphere, the effect of a single bassoon F-sharp can sound devastating. Another influence rises from the page, that of the solo violin, which in this context would have been immediately reminiscent of Saint-Saëns' Danse Macabre to listeners of that time. But perhaps there's a touch of Rimsky-Korsakov's Scheherazade intended there as well. Then with the return to 3-4 time, Rachmaninoff returns to the influence of Tchaikovsky, but of the fourth movement of the Sixth Symphony this time, with its downward wandering main theme. He starts with solo oboe, then adds a phased sounding doubling with first clarinet, eventually dropping the oboe and picking up the bass clarinet. Listen for the compelling mixture of Shalomo register B-flat clarinet with low clarino register for the bass clarinet. It has a more poetic, less predictable sound than if two B-flat clarinets were doubling. The solemn brass chorale reprises, this time in C minor, with horns, trombones, and tuba doubled by low winds and English horn rather than the trumpets. The dynamic is also piano rather than mezzo forte crescendo. We get a richer, more colorful sound, but instead of tenuto dissonance on the augmented fourth like before, the strings reply with the opening 5-4 gesture. There's a bit of back and forth here in the time signatures and musical ideas as the opening mood attempts to reassert itself. And we also see the return of the little phrases that dovetailed wispily down the page.
From this point on, I don't think there's anything essentially new I could comment on here, except to say that programmatically, it appears that the boatman has dropped off the departed soul on the island, and is on his way back across the dark waters. Rachmaninoff keeps it interesting with little touches here and there of thematic material from other sections, as if the boatman is quickly passing by all the places we visited on the journey as he rose into the distance. Listen for those as I run the ending here, and especially for the return of the Dies Irae near the end in cellos, first bassoon, and the truly indispensable bass clarinet. As I mentioned in the first video, because of the extreme length and scope of this work, these lessons on Rachmaninoff's Isle of the Dead would have to be overviews rather than extremely in-depth analyses. I wish I did have time to really break down some of these pages in detail and really get into the DNA of the scoring approaches. But I do promise to return to that for other scores in future lessons while still having these overviews of other large-scale works. Thanks so much for joining me with these lessons and have a safe and happy Halloween.